The best we can normally do in coming to terms with the fourth dimension is to draw analogies with the third. For instance, if we were to ask, what would a four-dimensional hypersphere look like if it were to pass through our space? We can get an impression by considering what happens if a sphere passes through a plane. Suppose there are two-dimensional beings who inhabit that plane, looking along the surface of their world, which is all they can do. They see only dots or lines of different length, which they interpret as two-dimensional figures. As our 3D sphere initially makes contact with their 2D space, they see it as a dot, which then grows into a circle reaching a maximum diameter equal to the diameter of the sphere, before the circle shrinks again to a dot and then disappears. Likewise, if a four sphere were to intersect our space, we'd see it as a dot that expanded, like a bubble, into a three-dimensional sphere of maximum size before shrinking and finally vanishing. The true nature, the extra dimensionality of the four sphere would be hidden from us, although its mysterious appearance, growth and disappearance would probably cause us to wonder what was going on. Four-dimensional beings would have seemingly magical powers in our world. They could, for example, pick up a right-handed glove flip it over in the fourth dimension and put it back as a left-handed one, just as we could with a two-dimensional glove. In principle, they could do this with a whole person. In his short tale, The Platner Story, H.G. Wells describes the remarkable case of Gottfried Platner, a teacher who disappears for nine days following an explosion in a school chemistry lab. Upon his return, He's effectively a mirror image of his previous self, though his recollections of what happened during the period of absence were met with incredulity. Being flipped over for real in the fourth dimension would be bad for your health, apart from the shock of seeing yourself look different in the mirror, our faces being surprisingly asymmetric. Many of the crucial chemicals in our bodies, including glucose and most amino acids, have a certain handedness. Molecules of DNA, for example, which take the form of a double helix, always twist like a right-handed screw. If all these chemicals had their handedness reversed, we'd quickly die of malnutrition because much of the essential nutrients in our food, from plants and animals, would now be in a form we couldn't assimilate. Mathematical interest in a fourth spatial dimension began in the first half of the 19th century with the work of the German Ferdinand Mobius. He's best remembered for his study of a shape that's now named after him, the Mobius Band, and as a pioneer of the field known as topology. It was he who first realized that in a fourth dimension, a 3D form could be rotated into its mirror image. In the second half of the 19th century, three mathematicians stood out as explorers of the new realm of multidimensional geometry. The Swiss Ludwig Schlafi, the Englishman Arthur Cayley, and the German Bernhard Riemann. Schlafi began his magnum opus, The Theory of Continuous Manifolds, by saying, the treatise is an attempt to found and develop a new branch of analysis that would, as it were, be a geometry of n dimensions containing the geometry of the plane and space as special cases for n equals 2 and 3. He went on to describe multidimensional analogues of polygons and polyhedrons, which he called polyschemes. These are now commonly known as polytopes, a term coined by the German mathematician Reinhold Hopp and introduced to English researchers by Alicia Boole Stott daughter of George Boole, who devised Boolean algebra, and Mary Everest Boole, a self-taught mathematician and writer on the subject. Also to Schlafi's credit is the discovery of the higher dimensional relatives of the platonic solids. A platonic solid is a convex shape with regular polygon faces and the same number of faces meeting at each corner. There are five of them, the cube, tetrahedron, octahedron, 12-sided dodecahedron and 20-sided icosahedron. 
The four dimensional equivalents of the platonic solids are the convex regular four polytopes, of which Schlafy found there were six, named after the number of cells they have. The simplest four polytope is the five cell, which has five tetrahedral cells, ten triangular faces, ten edges, and five vertices, and is analogous to the tetrahedron. Then there's the eight cell or tesseract, and its dual, the 16 cell, obtained by replacing cells with vertices, faces with edges, and vice versa. The 16 cell has 16 tetrahedral cells, 32 triangular faces, 24 edges, and 8 vertices, and is the four-dimensional analogue of the octahedron. Two other four polytopes are the 120 cell, an analogue of the dodecahedron, and the 600 cell, an analogue of the icosahedron. Finally, there's the 24 cell, which has 24 octahedral cells and no three-dimensional counterpart. Interestingly, Schlafy found the number of convex regular polytopes in all higher dimensions is the same, just three. Through the work of Cayley, Riemann and others, Mathematicians learned how to do complex algebra in 4D and branch out into multidimensional geometries that went beyond the rules prescribed by Euclid. But what they still couldn't do was actually see in four dimensions. The question was, could anybody? This was a problem that intrigued the British mathematician, teacher and writer of scientific romances, Charles Howard Hinton. In his 20s and early 30s, Hinton taught at two private schools in England, first at Cheltenham College in Gloucestershire, and then at Uppingham School in Rutland, where a fellow teacher was Howard Candler, a friend of Edwin Abbott. It was during this period in 1884 that Abbott published his now classic satirical novel Flatland, a romance of many dimensions. Four years earlier, Hinton had penned an article of his own on alternative spaces called What is the Fourth Dimension, in which he put forward the idea that particles moving around in three dimensions might be thought of as successive cross-sections of lines and curves existing in four dimensions. We ourselves might really be four-dimensional beings. And our successive states, the passing of them through the three-dimensional space, to which our consciousness is confined. The extent of the relationship between Abbott and Hinton isn't clear, but they certainly knew of each other's work and some social contact would have taken place, if only via their mutual friend and colleague. Candler would surely have discussed with Abbott the young teacher at Uppingham who wrote and spoke so openly about other dimensions. Hinton was nothing if not unconventional. At the time he was teaching in England, he married Mary Ellen Boole, eldest daughter of Mary Everest Boole, herself the daughter of George Everest, after whom the tallest mountain is named, and George Boole. Unfortunately, three years into his marriage, Hinton also went through a secret wedding ceremony with another woman, Maud Weldon, whom he'd met while at Cheltenham College and had twin children by. Probably the attitudes of his father, James Hinton, a surgeon and head of a sect devoted to polygamy and free love, played a part in Charles's behaviour. In any event, Hinton was jailed for several days and found guilty of bigamy at an Old Bailey trial. With his first family, he then fled to Japan, where he taught for some years before becoming an instructor of mathematics at Princeton University. There, in 1897, he designed a species of baseball gun which, with the help of gunpowder charges, fired out balls at speeds of 40 to 70 miles per hour. The New York Times described it as a heavy cannon with a barrel about two and a half feet in length with a rifle attachment in the rear. Its cleverest trick, throwing curved balls, was accomplished with the help of two curved rods which are inserted in the barrel of the cannon. For a few seasons, the Princeton 9 used it on and off before abandoning it as a safety hazard. Whether the injuries it caused were a factor in Hinton's dismissal from the college is unclear, but 
They didn't prevent him reintroducing the machine at the University of Minnesota, where briefly, in 1900, he held a teaching post before joining the US Naval Observatory. Hinton's fascination with the fourth dimension, stretching back to his days as a teacher in England, began at a time when others were writing about the subject and often speculating about its possible links with spiritualism. In 1878, Friedrich Zollner, professor of astronomy at the University of Leipzig, published a paper called On Space of Four Dimensions. Zollner started by referencing Bernard Riemann's seminal paper on the hypotheses which underlie geometry, published in 1868, two years after Riemann's death and 14 years after its contents were first delivered as a lecture by Riemann while still a student at the University of Göttingen. Riemann developed the concept first hinted at by his supervisor at Göttingen, Carl Gauss, that three-dimensional space could be curved, just as a 2D surface such as a sphere can be, and extended this idea of the curvature of space into an arbitrary number of dimensions. The result, known as elliptic geometry, later formed a cornerstone of Einstein's general theory of relativity. Zollner also borrowed the notion described in an 1874 paper by the young projective geometrist Felix Klein that knots could be undone and rings unlinked simply by lifting them into a fourth dimension and turning them over. In this way, Zollner set the scene for his explanation of how spirits, existing as he saw it on a higher plane, could perform the various phenomena, especially the knot untying tricks that he'd witnessed at seance experiments with the famous and fraudulent medium Henry Slade. Hinton, like Zollner, was inclined to think that mere habit of perception limited us to a 3D viewpoint and that a fourth dimension might be all around us and become visible to us if we could only train ourselves to see it.